Welcome to Physical Chemistry 1 Level 3. I am Dr. Min Su Lim, and I will show you how to carry out the lab in the experimental and theoretical aspects. You will do a two-week-long experiment titled Binary Liquid Vapor Phase Diagram. I want you to follow my instruction thoroughly, slide by slide. After you complete this online pre-lab lecture, you should take an online quiz that is posted on D2L. You may watch this video as many times as you need, but you have only one chance to take the quiz. In this lab, you will learn the phase rule, the ideal solution that satisfies Rao's law, the deviation of solution from Rao's law, and the significance of agiotrop. You will determine whether a mixture of cyclohexanone and tetrachloroethane exhibits positive or negative deviation from Rao's law, and understand the cause of the deviation. You will also determine the temperature and the composition of cyclohexanone and tetrachloroethane mixture at the agiotrop. What is a phase? A phase is a state of matter that is uniform throughout in chemical composition and physical states. Well-known examples of phases are solid, liquid, and gas. Let's try several example problems. How many phases are present in salt water? Sodium chloride dissolves in water and makes a homogeneous mixture, which is also called a solution. So, the NaCl solution is uniform throughout in chemical composition and physical states. Consequently, the number of phases in NaCl solution is 1. How many phases are present in ice water? Both ice and liquid water is uniform in chemical composition. However, their physical states are different. Ice is solid while water is liquid. Consequently, there are two phases present in ice water. A constituent is a chemical substance that is present in a system. It can be an ion or a molecule. How many constituents are present in a mixture of ethanol and water? Obviously, there are two constituents, ethanol and water. How many constituents are present in salt water or an ACL solution? Water, Na plus ion, and Cl minus ion. So it's three. Components are chemically independent constituents of a system or the minimum number of independent species that are necessary to define the composition of all the phases present in the system. If there is no reaction and no constraints in the system, the number of components, C, equals the number of constituents, S. Suppose there is a simple mixture of NH3, N2, H2. The number of constituents is 3, and so is the number of components, because there is no reaction nor any constraints in the system. And accordingly, each constituent is independent of one another. But how about a system containing ammonia that is thermally and partially decomposed into N2 and H2 and reached equilibrium? Obviously, the number of constituents is 3. Then, how about the number of components? The amount of N2 and H2 is dependent upon the initial amount of NH3. So, we know somehow that the number of components are not the same as the number of constituents. Would there be any easy way to determine the number of components in the system? Here is a mathematical equation. C equals S minus M minus N. M stands for the number of any constraints like charge neutrality or balance of concentration, and N stands for the number of chemical equilibrium equations. 
Ammonia is thermally decomposed to gaseous nitrogen and hydrogen until the reaction reaches equilibrium. As a result, we have one equilibrium equation like this one, implying that the N under this condition is 1. The partial pressures of N2 and H2 depend on the pressure of NH3 as shown in this equation. This makes one constraint implying that the M under this condition is also 1. Now, plug these values into the equation from the previous slide. C equals S minus M minus N in order to determine the number of components. It is 3 minus 1 minus 1, which is 1. It shows that there is one component in the system. It implies that we need only the concentration or the pressure of one constituent to define the composition of this system. It could be one of NH3, N2, and H2. What if you are given with a simple mixture of NH3, N2, and H2 and hits the mixture to decompose only NH3 to N2 and H2? We have a problem here. The partial pressure of N2 or H2 does not depend on the initial partial pressure of NH3 because there are N2 and H2 present even before the decomposition of NH3 begins. So, the overall pressures of N2 and H2 cannot be correlated with the partial pressure of NH3. As a result, M is 0 while N is 1, since we still have an equilibrium equation. Consequently, C equals 2. Phase rule allows us to determine the number of intensive variables F that can be changed independently without disturbing the number of phases in equilibrium. Mathematical expression of the phase rule is F equals C minus P plus 2. F stands for the variance, or the degrees of freedom, or the number of independent intensive variables. Let's apply this phase rule to a one-component system like water. A phase diagram of water is shown on the left. Region 1 in the phase diagram represents the solid phase of water. So the number of phases P equals 1 in this region. Since it's one component system, C equals 1 as well. Consequently, F equals 2 at region 1. What does it mean? It means that you have two intensive variables that can be changed independently without disturbing the number of phases at region 1. Those two independent intensive variables are pressure and temperature. Region 2 in the phase diagram is on the solid-liquid phase boundary line where both solid and liquid coexist. So, the number of phases P equals 2. And once again, the number of component C is still 1, since it's a single component system. Consequently, F equals 1 at region 2. It means you have only one intensive variable that can be changed independently without disturbing the number of phases at any point in this phase boundary line. It could be either pressure or temperature. You may change pressure along the phase boundary line, but once pressure is determined, then temperature at that pressure is fixed automatically. The same is true to temperature. Region 3 represents the triple point where three phases coexist. Accordingly, the number of phases P is 3, and the number of components C is 1. Then, F equals 0. It means that you have zero independent intensive variable at triple point. 
The triple point of a substance is always fixed, and it is one of the intrinsic properties of matter for that reason. Suppose that we are dealing with a two-component system that consists of two volatile liquid components, A and B. These two components are completely miscible. It is obvious that C is 2 and P is 1 because both components are miscible and form a single liquid phase. Then, the number of independent intensive variables, F, is 3. What are these three variables? They are temperature, pressure, and composition of A, or simply the mole fraction of A, which is denoted by XA. Keep in mind that XB is not an independent variable, because XB depends on XA due to the relation of XA plus XB equals 1. If temperature is fixed to a constant, the remaining variables are P and XA. Then we may construct a phase diagram by plotting pressure versus XA. On the other hand, if we fix pressure to a constant, the remaining variables are T and XA. Then we may construct a phase diagram by plotting temperature versus XA. You will see these two types of phase diagrams in the following slides. Routh's law states that the partial pressure of a volatile liquid A in an ideal solution is proportional to its mole fraction, Xa. Routh's law can be expressed mathematically as Pa equals Xa times Pa star. Take note that the proportionality constant is Pa star, which is the vapor pressure of pure A. The solution that satisfies Routh's law is called ideal solution. In an ideal solution, the homogeneous interactions are the same with heterogeneous interactions. Be aware that both liquid A and B are volatile. Suppose that liquid A is more volatile than liquid B, or PA star is greater than PB star. We can construct a pressure composition diagram under the condition of constant temperature. When XA equals zero, the system consists of B only. Consequently, the pressure is the vapor pressure of pure B, or PB star. When XA equals 1, the system consists of A only. Consequently, the pressure is the vapor pressure of pure A, or PA star. Since liquid A is more volatile than liquid B, as we assumed previously, PA star is greater than PB star. When XA is greater than 0, but less than 1, the system consists of both A and B. In other words, A and B form a solution. As XA increases, more of A occupies the system. Routh's law indicates that there is direct proportionality between the partial pressure of A and its mole fraction. This sloped straight line shows how the partial pressure of A in the mixture depends on the composition of A in liquid phase. And now, we all know that both A and B are volatile and form a vapor mixture. How would the composition of A in the vapor mixture would be related to the partial pressure of A? It is like this red curve. This is because more volatile liquid A would make vapor mixture richer in A. In a given pressure, the composition of vapor is represented by a red dotted arrow, while the composition of liquid is represented by a black dotted arrow. It illustrates that the composition of A in vapor is greater than the one in liquid. Now, the diagram has three regions. High pressure region is for the liquid phase, and low pressure region is for the vapor phase. 
and the region confined by two boundary lines is where vapor and liquid phases coexist. We may also construct a temperature composition diagram under the condition of constant pressure. Remember, the boiling point of pure liquid A, Ta star, is lower than the boiling point of pure liquid B, Tb star, based on our initial assumption that liquid A is more volatile than liquid B. High temperature region is for the vapor phase, and low temperature region is for the liquid phase. And the region confined by the two boundary lines is where both phases coexist. In an ideal solution, heterogeneous interactions are as strong as homogeneous interactions. An ideal solution also satisfies Raoult's law. But take note that not all solutions satisfy Raoult's law. This is because unbalanced intermolecular interactions will cause the deviation from the law. What if the heterogeneous interactions are greater than homogeneous interactions? This is a pressure composition diagram, and the dotted line represents the behavior of an ideal solution that satisfies Raoult's law. Greater heterogeneous interactions than homogeneous interactions imply that the molecules of different kinds, like A and B, hold on to each other more strongly than the molecules of the same kind, like A and A, or B and B. It will cause lower vapor pressure than the pressure expected from the Raoult's law, which leads to the negative deviation from the Raoult's law. Mixing A and B is favorable and stabilizes the system, which would cause the reduction of enthalpy and the volume of the mixture. The corresponding temperature composition diagram shows a reverse shape of the phase boundary lines. Take note that the pressure minimum in the pressure composition diagram or the boiling point maximum in the temperature composition diagram is called agiotrope. It stands for boiling without change of composition. At this point, the separation of liquid mixture by distillation is not possible. I will talk more about the agiotrope in the next slide. What if the homogeneous interactions are greater than heterogeneous interactions? Greater homogeneous interactions than heterogeneous interactions imply that the molecules of the same kind hold on to each other more strongly than the molecules of a different kind. It will cause higher vapor pressure than the pressure expected from Raoult's law. This would lead to the positive deviation from Raoult's law. A pressure maximum in the pressure composition diagram or a boiling point minimum in the temperature composition diagram will be observed. Mixing A and B is unfavorable and destabilizes the system, which would cause the raise of enthalpy and the volume of the mixture. We may separate the liquid mixture into each component by distillation. This is a binary liquid vapor phase diagram. I will use this diagram and show you the step-by-step -step distillation process to separate the liquid mixture into components A and B. This is the distillation apparatus that you should set up in this lab. The liquid mixture remaining in the distillation flask is called liquid residue, and the vapor condensed and collected in the receiving flask is called vapor distillate. Suppose that you are given with a liquid mixture of A and B with a mole fraction of 0.2 at temperature T1. It implies that the solution contains 20% A and 80% B by mole. Increase the temperature of solution to T2. The solution begins to vaporize at this temperature. Collect the vapor. The composition of the collected vapor, or 
the mole fraction of A in the vapor is 0.6. Decrease the temperature until the vapor is condensed. Now, the vapor distillate is much richer in A, meaning 60% A and 40% B by mole. It makes sense because A has lower boiling point as we assumed in the previous slide, which would make the vapor richer in A. Now, increase the temperature of the distillate to T3. The distillate begins to vaporize at T3. Collect the vapor. The mole fraction of A in the collected vapor is 0.8 which implies that the vapor is now much richer in A. Decrease the temperature until the distillate is condensed. As this process continues, the composition of the vapor distillates become close to that of pure A. Okay, then, can we separate a liquid mixture that has an agiotrope? This is an example phase diagram that has an agiotrope. Suppose that you are given with a liquid mixture of A and B with more fraction of 0.7 at T1. Increase the temperature of solution to T2. The solution begins to vaporize. Remove the A-rich vapor. Since the A-rich vapor is removed, the remaining liquid residue will be richer in B. The mole fraction of A in the liquid residue is 0.6. Increase the temperature of solution to T3. As this process is continued, the composition of the remaining liquid residue will reach to the agiotrope. As you can see in the diagram, you cannot separate the mixture further at agiotrope. This is because the liquid mixture at agiotrope boils or condenses at the same temperature. Here is the experimental procedure. During this two-week-long experiment, you will collect 10 vapor distillate samples and 10 liquid residue samples for the measurements of refractive index. You will collect first six pairs of samples and complete the refractive index measurements in the first week. In the following week, you will do the last four pairs of samples. You will use tetrachloroethane and cyclohexanone and construct a binary liquid vapor phase diagram of the mixture of the two compounds. It is very critical to clean and dry the glassware prior to the experiment. Transfer 125 milliliters of tetrachloroethane into the distilling flask. Distill enough to give a constant temperature 146 Celsius at 760 Tor. Take note that the temperature would not reach exactly 146 Celsius because the laboratory pressure is usually lower than 760 Tor. So, the temperature could be lower than 146 Celsius. You will correct this later with stem correction and pressure effect correction. Collect sample 1V and 1L for analysis. Apply the same procedure to mixtures of tetrachloroethane and cyclohexanone at constant temperatures of 149 Celsius 151 Celsius, 154 Celsius, and collect samples 2L, 2V, 3L, 3V, and 4L, 4V. The temperature of the distillate should be recorded by averaging the initial and final temperatures in the course of the collection of the distillate. The temperature of the liquid residue should be recorded at the point when the distillation is stopped to collect the sample of the residue. Apply the same procedure to step 5 and 6 and collect samples 5L5V and 6L6V. Record the laboratory temperature and pressure. You will need them later for stem correction and pressure effect correction. 
once you collected all samples of vapor distillate and liquid residue, you should bring them to the hood where a refractometer is installed. The refractive index should be measured and recorded as soon as possible because the samples may decompose on standing. All measurements should be done in the hood that provides good ventilation. You should hold your breath while reading the scale through the eyepiece of the refractometer to avoid inhalation of vapor. Now, familiarize yourself with each part of refractometer. Eyepiece, thermometer, coarse scale adjust knob, fine scale adjust knob, press and hold to read scale button, movable light source, lower prism, upper prism. The following is the operational procedure of a refractometer. Turn on the power of the refractometer. Light source will be turned on. Open the prism assembly by lifting the upper prism to the left. Clean both upper and lower prisms by gently wiping off the prisms with acetone. Place a single drop of a sample solution. Never touch the prisms with any hard object like a tip of a pipette or you will scratch the surface of prism. Do not recycle a used Pasteur pipette for different sample solutions. Close the upper prism. Raise the light on the end of the movable arm so that the light illuminates the upper prism. Look in the eyepiece to find crosshairs and a shadow line as shown below. Turn the coarse scale adjust knob and fine scale adjust knob to bring the shadow line to the center as shown in the picture. Press the press and hold to read scale button and read the upper scale for refractive index. Read the number where a vertical line crosses. Try this example for practice. Pause the video and read off the refractive index of a sample solution from the scale that is seen through the eyepiece of a refractometer. What is the refractive index of the sample? It is 1.4602. Once all measurements were completed like the way you practiced in this example, Dispose of the cyclohexanone and tetrachloroethane mixtures into a designated waste vessel. Stem length of a thermometer and laboratory pressure influence boiling temperatures. So, you have to adjust the measured temperatures with stem correction and pressure effect correction. X represents stem correction and it should be added to the measured temperatures. Alpha is the expansion coefficient of the liquid in the thermometer, and it is provided by the manufacturer of the thermometer. Since a mercury thermometer is used in this lab, you should use the value of 0 0.000154 for alpha. Delta T is the temperature difference between the temperature reading of the thermometer and where the stem emerges from the thermometer adapter. T1 is the temperature at which the thermometer was calibrated, that is 40 Celsius, and T2 is the room temperature. Y represents pressure effect correction, and it should be added to the measured temperatures. P bar is the barometric pressure, which will be posted on the laboratory board. Finally, you have to add X and Y to the measured temperatures and get the corrected boiling temperatures. The experimental procedure on the second week is the same with the one that you did on the first week. Follow the step-by-step -step instruction and collect the samples of 7L, 7V, 8L, 8V, 9L, 9V, and 10L, 10V and complete the refractive index measurements. In this slide, I will show you how to utilize the refractive index of a sample to determine the weight percent and the mole fraction of cyclohexanone. 
construct a plot of weight percent versus log ND20 using the following table. Take note that ND20 represents refractive index. This table was taken from the lab textbook. You should use a spreadsheet software like Microsoft Excel. The plot would look like this one. Find the equation for the best fit line or trend line. Calculate log ND20 of a sample and plug it into X in the equation to get the weight percent of cyclohexanone. Now, I will show you how to convert the weight percent of cyclohexanone to its mole fraction. Suppose that the weight percent of cyclohexanone that you determined graphically is 42.6%. It implies in 100 gram mixture, you have 42.6 grams of cyclohexanone and 57.4 grams of tetrachloroethane. You have to convert the gram mass of each component into its moles. The mole of cyclohexanone is 0.4341 moles. Take note that a bar on top of the number 4 is to represent the last significant digit. Likewise, the mole of tetrachloroethane is 0.3420 moles. The mole fraction of cyclohexanone in the sample can be determined by dividing the moles of cyclohexanone by the total moles. And it is 0.559. Since it's a binary mixture, the mole fraction of the other component, tetrachloroethane, is simply 1 minus the mole fraction of cyclohexanone. So, the mole fraction of tetrachloroethane is 0.441. You should include at least the following items in your lab report. Number 1. A completed data table like this one. Number 2. A binary liquid vapor phase diagram of cyclohexanone and tetrachloroethane, which is a plot of temperature versus the mole fraction of cyclohexanone. Discuss what would have caused the deviation from the Routes law. Number 3. Determine the boiling temperature and the mole fraction of cyclohexanone at the agiotrope and compare them with the literature values. Discuss what would have caused the deviation of the experimental values from the literature values.